Okay, and we are live. Um, today's topic, how early can I start the Seder? Uh, normally, this is a topic, some interest for folks because the Seder is late, people get hungry, people are tired from working, and children, if there are children in the picture, it gets late for them and people legitimately want the kids to participate after all. So much of the Seder itself is designed around the commandment of the Higarate le Bincha Bayamahu Lemur, Ki Shalcha Bincha Machar Lemur, that you should teach the next generation this story of the Exodus and its lessons. And so we want to include people. This question takes on a different valence this year, though, because many people um, are rightly concerned with isolated individuals and just the general sense that the part of the Seder that for many people makes it the Seder is the cacophony, the family, the guests, um, the debate, the side conversations, the singing, the interaction, and with folks socially distant that um, kills the social closeness that is the prime ingredient in the Seder. So uh, some people have been discussing this idea that you might use Zoom for a Seder. Um, I wasn't gonna get into that much. Um, maybe we'll discuss that a little bit at the end. Um, but one possibility that's emerged um, from some Rabbanim, like Rav Yosef Sri Ramon in Israel and others, that you might do some of the Seder early before it's dark and before the holiday is started on Zoom to avoid the prohibitions of electricity and computer use on Yom Tov on the holiday, um, which raises a whole separate set of other questions. How early can I do the Seder? Can I do it before the sun sets or must it be done after dark or at night? And how do we understand this? Actually, this learning um, won't just answer this question, but it'll teach us a lot of things that are useful to know about the Passover Seder. I'm going to share the screen, prepared a source sheet. You can find this sheet on Svaria. If you type in how early may I start the Seder um, and look for my sheet, it's publicly available. So the first source we'll go through is in the 12th chapter of Exodus Shmos. It says, that now this is the command in Parsha's bow for that year, the very first Passover, uh, but it's the paradigm for all future Passovers. And in describing the Korban Pesach, the Passover sacrifice, it says you should eat it, eat the night, the meat, on that same night. You should eat it roasted over the fire with matzah and bitter herbs. Note, with matzah and bitter herbs implies contemporaneously at the same time, but Hillel's big chiddush was to make it into a wrap, not a sandwich, a wrap. That's because it was soft. See all the other videos and source sheets on soft matzah or check out mitzvahmatzahs.org. End of that side plug. So Hillel's big chiddush here was that they should be eaten together um, and not just at the same time. Uh, Okay, so that aside, the key component we're discussing here is balayla hazet, on that night, which implies it must be done at night. That's talking about the Passover sacrifice. Of course, our Seder doesn't actually have the Passover sacrifice. We don't bring the Passover sacrifice or any sacrifice anymore. But there's a related um, command in the next chapter of Exodus. It says, the 13th chapter, a pasuk, the Higarata Levincha Bayomahule Mor, Bavor Zah Sa Adonai Libet Setimi Mitzrayim, Bayadachal Laota Yadra, the Zikaron Ben Nacham, the Mantia Torata Donan Befirha, Kibiat Hazakal Tiaha Donan Mitzrayim, the Shamarta, the Hakazo, the Moada, Miamim Yamim. So when your child, here's the son, asks you on that day saying, It is because of what the Lord did for me when I went free from Egypt. 
and this shall serve a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead in order that the teaching of God be in your mouth. And of course, this verse is alluding to the idea of tefillin, according to some, it's just a metaphor, but others, it's actually alluding to the notion of a, an amulet, a phylactery, tefillin, and it's in the tefillin. Um, and you should observe this law in its season every year, right? So the idea that Passover should be observed every year is tied to um, telling the child, is to repeating the story and passing on these lessons from generation to generation seasonally. And so this notion, which becomes the basis of Sipor Yitzhak Mitzrayim, telling the story, has Bayomahu on that day. So we have a question, and it's a real question. It's actually in the Haggadah text, but it's a legitimate question if you're trying to read the Hamash, read the Torah. The first verse said that the sacrifice has to be at night, and the second command about the story said it has to be on that day. The natural question is, is that day, Bayom Mahu, the same as that night, Belayla Hazet, or could it be some other time? So the Mechilta of Rabbi Yishmael says it, in this language. And this may sound familiar to you because this Mechilta in one version or another actually is quoted in the Haggadah. So the Haggadah itself um, contains this meta discussion of whether the Haggadah can be recited at its own time or some other time, which is a funny thing in the context of Passover. But he got it to the Mincha. So you might think that I can do it any time in Nisan, that the month is, because it says, what, now why might I think that? It's not stated here in the Mechilta, but since we quoted the whole parshia before the whole paragraph, that you should observe it every year in its season. So Aviv, the spring, should be sufficient. The month of Nisan, maybe I would think it's okay. Therefore, it tells you not just in the season, but it must be on the right day, on that day. If it has to be on that day, Yom implies day. There's no aspect of night and day. So maybe what that means is that I could do it while it's still light out. In other words, there's a concept, and we'll get to this later, that uh, there's a debate between the Chachamim, the sages, and Rabbi Yehuda about when it is evening enough for the context of the evening prayer, um, and also for voluntarily starting Shabbat and holidays early, adding from Kodesh to Chol, from Sanctity to secular days. So People are familiar with the idea that you can bring in Shabbat early, you can start it early. How early? The generally understood halacha is from Plag Hamincha, an hour and a quarter before the astronomical sunset, one and a quarter proportional hours. That's called Plag Hamincha. Uh, and the Chachamim say that the evening prayer happens after the sunset, but Rabbi Yehuda feels that it can happen after Plag Hamincha. And so we um, in the Talmud there don't rule like either opinion. If you do like this one, it's okay. And if you do like that one, it's okay, the Talmud rules. So I might have thought, based on that, Talmud Lamar, um, sorry, maybe I can do it, meaning from Plaga Mincha onward in the late afternoon when the feeling of the holiday is already setting in and the day is winding down, even if the astronomical sign of the end of the day, the sunset hasn't yet occurred. After all, even the evening prayer, maybe Shabbat could be started, maybe I could tell the story at 6 p.m. before the sun is set. But it says in the Pasuk, because of this. So you need a tangible symbol to teach the children. In other words, the verse isn't just saying tell the story, it's saying the story must be told in a manner of experiential education. So this is the Torah's commandment of progressive education. When you tell the story, you must have the physical props. At the time when the matzah, the bitter herbs, are on the table before you. So you have to, you have to be able to handle, to, and, and, and so when is that? So that is when the Pesach is. That gets us back to the 12th chapter, right? At night. It, that it's raw and with the matz and the mars. The matz and the mar come with the sacrifice. And so here we've linked um, the tangible manifestations of the observance with the sipor yitzhi of Mitzrayim and saying that they all must be at night. This is what the mechilta says. So from the mechilta, it sounds like your seder can only happen at night. 
and maybe not just after the sun sets, but Misha Tachshach from Tetach Ochavim, from the darkest part of, you know, from when the, the stars are out, from when it's actually night, not a period of doubt. And I, this is the sort of normal opinion that people uh, generally follow in most years, which leads to the mystery and magic of the Seder being a late night experience. I can still recall very fondly staying up late to have the Seder with my grandfather and grandmother, and it was late. That was part of the fun. Okay. Now, just to deal with this concept generally, not on Pesach, because this will become an important uh, piece of learning we'll need to analyze correctly. It says in Brachot concerning just the day in general, which I've mentioned a, a little bit already. I'm Rabbi Chia Barabin. Rav, Sali, Shal Shabbos, Be'erav Shabbos. Rav prayed, right, an important uh, just linking the Tanandic era to the um, Amoraim, so transitioning from the Mishnah to the Gemara, an extremely significant sage. He prayed the Friday night prayers on Friday afternoon. He prayed the Friday night prayers on Friday afternoon. Rabbi Yoshia prayed the Saturday night prayers while it was still Saturday afternoon. So that's nice that he prayed early, but maybe that's just um, uh, significant for prayer. It's um, unique to the fact that prayer can happen early, but maybe he didn't recite the Kiddush on a cup of wine, meaning it's not the day yet for the biblical commandments to occur. Prayer, which is rabbinic, according to most understandings in the Talmud, see a significant debate between Rambam and Ramban about that issue, but assuming prayer is rabbinic, so that's nice that a rabbinic thing could be done earlier, but what about a biblical commandment, right? Zahor, of, of remembering the Sabbath day, al hakos, yayin, do it over wine. Tashma da amr of nachman, amr shmul, mispal atim shal shabbos, be'erav shabbos, ve'omer kiddush al hakos. So they bring a teaching um, that says that you can pray and you can recite kiddush, ve'hilchas ha'kibase, and that's the law. So the uh, unequivocal statement of rabbinic law is that you can bring in Shabbos early. In fact, it's a mitzvah to do with this concept of adding Kedusha to the secular becomes not just a technicality about the start of Shabbos, but a path in religious worship about bringing down or infusing physical and secular things with sanctity or unearthing the sanctity already inherent. Okay, so the question becomes, we have these two competing principles. One is that you can bring in Shabbat and not just Shabbat for prayer, but Shabbat even for biblical commandments like Kiddush, the full sanctity of the day early, as Rav did. But on the other hand, that the Passover sacrifice can only be eaten specifically at night, and the matzah and the mara are linked to it, and the telling of the story is linked to the matzah and the mara, according to this concept in the Mechilta, which is quoted in the Haggadah itself. So we have a tension. Can, you know, on the one hand, one of the uh, lines of thinking would suggest that you can start a holiday early if it's late enough in the afternoon, but the other line of thinking says that doesn't work for Pesach. The Mishnah in Pesachim, in uh, Arbe Pesachim, says as follows, Pesachim samoch adam That in the afternoon, and there's significant debate in Gemara, which afternoon, late afternoon, early afternoon, you can't eat until it gets dark. Big meal, small meal, anything, matzah, okay. Long discussion, but in the afternoon of Passover, the mission states a person should not eat until it becomes dark. Language is ad shach, from choshach, until it becomes dark. Even someone who is in poverty should not eat um, until they and they shouldn't have less than four cups of wine. Even if you need to rely on charity to get four great cups of wine that night, that's that's okay. Okay, so that's what the Mishnah says. Tosvos and the Gemara say the following thing. Why does it need to say until it's dark? Meaning, they should just say, don't eat on Erev Pesach. Why do I need to tell you until it gets dark? Isn't that obvious? But oh, did the Gemara gabi Shabbos as Yom Tov and Loka Tani And how come in the Gemara they didn't need to say until it gets dark about Shabbos and Yom Tov? Omer Rimi Korbiels that the gabi Matzah Davka, but you know not just We're specifically talking about Matzah here. Kedetani b'Tosefta 
putting it to Sefta, Pesach, Matzah, and Marim. Mitzvah, Sam, Mishit, Tachshat, that these three things, Matzah, Pesach, Matzah, and Maror, the Mitzvah, as mentioned in the Torah, is Balai Vahazet, when it gets dark. The Tama Mishim, Dachsi, Vachlu, at the Basar, Balai Vahazet. Matzah, Maror, East Kashu, the Pesach. And here's the thing, Matzah and Maror are connected to Pesach, to the Korban Pesach, to the sacrifice. There's a, a Hekesh, a link between them. They have to be at the same time. If you want to have Shabbos dinner 45 minutes before sunset, anytime after an hour and a quarter before sunset, have at it. As it says in Brachos, quoting the tradition of Rav, and you can even say Kiddush. Okay, so this is an important um, point in the Tosavos. Now, this can be taken in two ways if we want to analyze it. On the one hand, they seem to be doubling down on the teaching of the Mechilta, um, that these other things, Matzah and Mar, need to be at night and maybe everything else. But, but the other way of taking it is that the Tosavos only mentions the mitzvahs that are explicitly mentioned in the Torah as needing to be at night, the Matzah and the Maror. But it doesn't say anything about Kiddush, doesn't say anything about the four cups of wine, and it certainly doesn't say anything about the very beginning of the Seder, the four questions, Sipor Yitzias Mitzrayim, the story is not linked. And so it, it uh, works with what we know from Parshas Bo, the 12th chapter of Exodus, but it, it doesn't fully codify the teaching of the Mechilta, at least not in this teaching of the Rimi Korbiel. Okay. We have from the Rashbats, Shem Ben Samach, important bridge figure in the 14th century, Venir Shetzarev Gamkin, so he says that the blessing on eating matzah should be after dark. And no one doubts this. And he says, and so too, the four cups of wine. So just so we understand, this is a source in sort of the, the end of the period of the Rishon in that period. It's still an important uh, um, formative period of Jewish law yet. Things aren't totally fixed. And so he says matzah for sure has to be at night. And the four cups of wine, so expanding a little bit on the toast, would also have to be after dark at night because those four cups are kind of linked to everything essential. And the first cup is Kiddush. So it sounds like you can't start the Seder, which starts basically with Kiddush, until after dark. But the Ein Minhag Bedakte Pekosh Al Kiddush Lefisha Mosefin Mechalala Kodesh. We're not accustomed to be stringent with making sure that Kiddush starts after dark, even though the four cups should occur after dark. Why? Because we have a conflicting concept. Not that we can add from Chol Ala Kodesh, maybe it's just that we can, but maybe it's even that we ought to, that there's positive value, at the very least that it's, it's a viable option and maybe it's, it's a desirable thing spiritually. And because of this sort of conflict in principles, um, the compromise here is that Kiddush can be said early, according to the Rashbats. It's explicit about that. Kiddush, the first cup, can happen early. And the Maril, who recorded customs in Minhagim, um, famously writes as follows. Amr Mari Segal, Pliya Niskava Be'enai Alma Shetzrichim Lahamtini Masidra Alayla. So it's a, it's a great uh, wonder in my eyes that it's like a, a little mysterious that we need to wait until the night, imishum ba'erev tochluif, it's because you should eat matzah at night. Da'yan afi mi yaschil shavios or kodam alayla. Ayde kiddush v'sipar akadi yalayla term shilchul matzah. You know, the Seder can go on. So it's a, Seder can lag. So by the time you get to matzah already, matzah, you're already at shulchan orech, at the festive meal. When do we, you're there. So it could be hours before. So why not start, if he says, if you start kiddush, Telling the Haggadah an hour and a quarter before the sunset. For sure, by the time you get to Malsa, it'll be dark. But maybe you'll say that the four cups of wine are linked thematically to Matza, and therefore, since Matza has to be like, so to the four cups of wine, this pushes the start time of Kiddush later. So, 
there's this um, interesting proof from the the final two cups, right? So there are four cups of wine. And the law with matzah, as we know from the answer to the wise son, is that after chatzot, you can't have afikomen, that you can't have, um, you, know, you need to have the final amount of matzah you're going to have by midnight, because the matzah was with the Korban Pesach, and all of it happened before mid midnight, chatzot alat, before that midnight time, which is so significant to the story. But the other two cups of wine, at least according to this opinion, you can have later. You can still be drinking the other cups of wine. The cup with benching the, the final cup can happen after chatzot, after the time that matzah can plausibly legally be eaten is over. And so if you would think that wine and matzah have to be in the same legal time period, then shouldn't it apply to after matzah as well? But we don't find that it does. So therefore, he says maybe um, the first, the, you know, you shouldn't link the cups of wine with matzah. So, he goes on to say, uh, in the, there is a Manda Amr that wants to link the four um, cups, but um, he, he doesn't think that that's right. But there is this other thing, right? A lot of the other things we do in the Seder, the remove, covering the mouths and covering the mouths in the old days, removing the table, moving the table, all those things are Lamanshi Shalu Atinoko so that the children ask. And the four questions, the actual asking of the children happens fairly early on in our Haggadah. So in Kain Sarchlios Balayla, that it maybe needs to be at night because it says because of this, B'Shasha Masamar Menachim Levanacha, quoting the Mechilta, this idea. And it says, be got it to the Vincha, and the Haggadah has to be at night. So maybe maybe the Mechilta, though, refutes this idea. Um, so there are these other sort of conflicting reasons, right? Which is that uh, you have people that don't take so long for their seders, and also immediately the first dipping and hand washing and the things that prompt the questioning occur right after kiddush in the Talmud the Haggadah. So it's kind of quoting. Uh, back and forth, um, you know, the Mari Segal who didn't really accept this idea, um, but the Mariel seems to think that, you know, what he's saying that the Haggadah takes a long time isn't sufficient, and also that these earlier elements in the Haggadah also ought to be at night, like the Mechilta. So the quoting opinions not that way, but and ultimately endorsing the stricter approach. So how should we, um, how should we do this in our day? So just see the black letter law in Shulchan Aruch for a minute, how it was codified. Shulchan Aruch, Rav Yosef Karowitz, as follows. Yes, Shulchan Aruch mi bodyom, k'dei le'achol miyad k'shetachshach. The table should be set, everything should be prepared from era of Pesach earlier in the day so that you can start immediately when it becomes dark. And even if you're studying or doing something extremely significant, you're studying to the apex of what would be significant, you got to cut it and get home early so that the Seder can start for the children. Uh, so, that, so that they don't fall asleep. But you can't say Kiddush, even this first cup, until it's dark. Linking, um, quoting from a tradition in the Torah, I didn't put it on this page, that the four cups are really part of the Haggadah and part of the story. Um, and you already saw that in the Rosh Bats. So he you know, said the first cup we're not strict about. The, the opposite verse, the four cups do matter and we're strict even about the first cup. So Shulchan Aruch um, codifies the stringent opinion, but is 
aware of the concerns of others. And so he hedges and says, just hurry up and start right on time as soon as you can. Start at the first minute of the stringent opinion and make sure to do it. But ultimately, in terms of the legal structure, he's stringent in his ruling. The Chassam Sefer, though, says, that, that no, um, that the things that require achitachshach, um, like the rashbas, the tashbits, are the eating. Those are the things that are linked directly, matzot, umerorim, um, and not necessarily the whole haggadah, the teaching of the mechata. That's a drasha, um, and that's nice, but who says that that should be the codified law? You can make Kiddush, that the legal, uh, the general legal analysis should hold. That as soon as the sun sets, you can make Kiddush, just like every Shabbos and Yom I'd add that when it says the sun sets here in the Chasim Sefer, he doesn't mean the sunset, he means Plaga Mimcha because that's when you can normally make Kiddush every Shabbos and Yom Tov. So it's, he thinks you can start your Seder early. And so you'll spend a lot of time in the Seder, and then you'll eat. So we have this lenient opinion of the Chasim Sefer. Just see the Mishnah Brewer here, Achit Tachshach. Oh, sorry, Avaluya Mar Kiddush, Rosal Mar. So the Mishnah Brewer explains, explain the Shulchan Aruch's opinion, Dilutim Akeven Shemitzel Maher Yascha Kiddush Vagadam Yibod Yom. Don't say that the Chasim Sefer, because we should hurry up, we should hurry up and do it from Erev Pesach already. Komoshim Atzina Beshabbos Viyom Tov Shachal Lohosiv Nechola Kodesh, where you can add from the secular day to the holy day, Lakadish Vilech Om Yibod Yom. Uh, as it's, it says earlier, right? Pesach, matzah Pesach. is linked to Pesach. Pesach Pesach is only at night. The matzah. The kiddush can only happen at a time that matzah could happen. Right. So the kiddush is one of the four cups and the four cups can only happen at the time that matzah and mar and that can only happen at night because of the link etc this whole story and explains that until dark doesn't mean sunset until the stars come out below not this time of in between of halachic death so we really have two um, opinions that set up even in later authorities the vast majority of later legal authorities follow the ruling of the shulchan aruch and double down on the stringencies the mission Bura, um, among them, but we do have the outlier of the Chassam Sefer, Rav Abad Yosef, and talking about soldiers in a, in a, in the Chazon of Bajit, um, ruled that in a, in a pressing situation, one could rely on some of these opinions to do it earlier. So you have Rav Abad Yosef and the Chassam Sefer and other notable post scheme and legal decisors who ruled like the Tashbets, um, that you can start and it's just the eating specifically of Masa and Mara that have to be at night. Now, um, most years, I would say there's um, still great value in you know, following the stringent approach. But maybe this year, because people want to do things on Zoom, that Bein Hashemashos is a better time to do that. And why would that be? Uh, Bein Hashemashos means between the sunsets, and it's, it's this time of halachic doubt. Once the sun sets, but it's not yet dark. Um, it's a debate. Is it yesterday or tomorrow? It's an in-between time. And the dividing line is fine, as the Talmud says, Keherafayin, and in the blink of an eye, it changes. It's a complicated debate. Vilna Gon, Rubina, talking about how we understand how long that time is, and when it switches, and when you count the day from, etc. But the important principle is that, um, the Daf Yomi not long ago was mentioned, that Bein Hashemashos, even if we're going to be stringent and treat it as Shabbat as we are, we treat it as Shabbat once the sun sets, but rabbinic laws don't necessarily apply in this time of rabbinic doubt because conceptually, um, rabbinic laws are, are rabbinic by, by definition, are fences. And um, there's a limit to the stringency the rabbis wanted to impose on the legal system with their own laws. You could say it more fundamentally that the Torah commands uh, not to add 
to the mitzvahs, Baal Tosef, that as Maimonides would ex express it, the Torah is sufficiently stringent and that more stringency isn't better, but there's a medium between leniency and stringency that results in an optimal religious outlook. If you become too aesthetic or stringent, it would be bad spiritually and religiously. And so the rabbis were aware of that and sought only to promote the Torah's observance, but not to increase infinitely the number of laws. Um, so in that vein, uh, there's a self-imposed limit on the sages' own restrictions to not apply at a time that's of doubt in any event. So the Rambam says that, well, so maybe we'll read in the Gemara first. Uh, I'll just quote it from, did I quote it here? The Gemara in Shabbos. Zimna Mishanile quotes an answer discussing carrying in different uh, domains and whether a certain carrying occurred at a particular time is to render not a problem. Who brishes are being the Eruv of the Carmelist? The Rebbe, he, the Amar called the Varshu Mishim Shvuz, the Gazula Benosh Mashos, as Rebbe says, anything with the rabbis decree that's a Shvuz about Shabbos, they didn't decree during Benosh Mashos, during this intermediate time. Now, it's a very complicated discussion about whether this applies to all rabbinic restrictions or just rabbinic restrictions. Um, that are extra, but rabbinic restrictions that guard biblical um, commandments may be apply, etc. So it's not the carte blanche it might seem from this reading. That being said, it is a general principle. The Mishnah Torah, the Rambam codifies it. Kol tvarim shein asurin mishum shus. All of the things that are prohibited because of a rabbinical prohibition, lo gazu aleim benashmashus. They didn't prohibit them uh, during this intermediate time. Ale ba'atzmo sheyomhu. Only on the Sabbath or Yom Tov day itself, Shein Asurin, Aval Benash Mashos Mutarin, but they are permissible during this uh, uncertain time. Ushi Yasham Devar Mitzvah Dochak. Now, that's only if you have a mitzvah or a pressing situation. Kitzad Mutarlo Benash Mashot Lalo Bailano Oleshutapane Amayim Lahabi Lulav Shofar, right? So you can violate rabbinic laws during Benish Mashos to get your lulav for Sukkot or your shofar for Rosh Hashanah, etc. So it has to be in the furtherance of a mitzvah. That's what the Rambam says. So it seems clear that this year um, we would be able to violate a rabbinic law, Bain Hashmashos, even for someone that maybe, or, or someone even before the sunset that brought on um, Yom Tov on their own. There's a debate if you bring on Yom Tov on your own. Uh, is it the full Yom Tov for you since you've accepted it early? Or is it only of some of a rabbinic nature? And this sort of rule would apply, but most authorities rule that an individual that brings on a holiday or Yom Tov early, um, these, this principle would still apply. It's considered a sort of period of rabbinic observance. And so therefore, combining the rabbinic prohibitions into this rabbinic observance wouldn't happen. Assuming that using the computer is only rabbinic, um, and that would really be a separate discussion about electricity, but we'll assume that for the moment, certainly that using Zoom, especially if it was preset, um, would only be rabbinic. So then you'd be able to, uh, by combining certain opinions, uh, the Tosh Beits and the Chassam Sefer, not like the Mechilta in the Haggadah, um, you'd be able to combine these things to have an early Zoom Seder and do everything except the eating of, eating of matzah and mar. You'd be able to certainly have the first cup of kiddush according to the tosh bits and the chasmus would be able to have the four questions and all those things. And just once you got up to the matzah um, and the mar, that's when you'd have to uh, wait till nightfall. So if someone was looking for sort of practical understanding of how you could do that, that would be. I just wanted to end with um, a Dvar Torah about this, um, which I think is the plain meaning. Um, you know, it occurred to me that there might be people having an early Seder this year, and they read the Mechilta that says that you can't have an early Seder. They're having the early Seder to do it on Zoom, and they're learning that Mechilta that says that you can't have the Seder early. Um, so that would be an interesting kind of situation. What is the, the thrust of the Mechilta? What's it getting at? Um, so it's not just experiential education. I think that's one component of it, that you can't have education that's divorced of visceral symbols like matzah that you eat, right? It's in the gut. And so it's not just teaching kids, but it's imbibing, <laughs> it's um, ingesting uh, the lessons and meaning an embodied sense of lesson, not an intellectualized one. So that's uh, one aspect of it. 
But the other is that the entire concept of freedom of the Korban Pesach in a Jewish sense is something like what the political philosopher Isaiah Berlin said, it's a positive notion of freedom. And so it's not freedom from obligations to do anything. I'm free to do whatever I want with no concern, but rather it's a sense of uh, being um, not imposed in ways that prevent us from being our best selves unduly. So we can, we're free to become uh, our best selves. I think the most popular version of this are the Navy commercials, right? Be all that you can be in the Navy. Um, that sense of freedom is what's being appealed to here. And so if we're talking about that, which I think we are, that freedom from Egypt isn't avadaihin. God says, you're my, <laughs> you're, uh, you know, you're my servants now. So that's not this negative notion of freedom. We're free to do whatever we want, but rather we're no longer um, confined in Egypt in a way that's soul crushing. We have these new commandments. Um, but these commandments are rooted in the notion of you know the soul of the oppressed. So we have obligations um, to follow the moral and just laws of the Torah uh, in this new sense. So we're free now uh, to be empowered, autonomous, obligated beings who are able to live uh, ethical lives rather than sort of being enslaved and isolated and absorbed in our own pity and suffering and understandably removed from an ability to engage in anything beyond our daily survival or um, just sort of slipping into a dullness and a deadness of existence that would sort of represent slavery, losing all hope, losing all aspiration or even feeling kind of numbness maybe is the best way to say it. So um, that's what this is about. That the mitzvah objects, the commandments of Pesach, Matzah, and Maror, eating these things have to be done with the telling of the story. In other words, the, the telling of the story must be linked to the time frame of obligation to fulfill the commandments. And in fact, the very notion of a limited time frame to fulfill the commandments that is inconvenient of having to stay up at night and all of that is precisely about a sense of greater obligation not to do whatever it is we want, but to do what we must do, we're required to do. So that's the teaching of the Mechotos. So even if people are going to be um, violating uh, maybe the Mechotos this year, uh, but maybe we can live the teaching. So it's twofold. One, that education ought to occur in an embodied sense with its props. It should be eaten, experienced, engaged, right? Um, educators know that it's one thing to teach a lesson on paper. It's another thing to have kids discover, go outside, learn, explore uh, naturally. And the same is true with adults. So the call for education that is uh, non-hypocritical, that is lived, that is experienced. And the second piece of the that uh, freedom is linked inextricably with obligation. So we'll close on that note. Um, and uh, I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, you can follow up with me. Maybe we'll do a postscript video on electricity and how it relates to Zoom um, and other important rulings that have come out, the Moroccan rabbis, Rabbi Shach, there are others and we can discuss. Um, that should close this, uh, this piece for now. How early can I start this seder?